Alright, so, um, yeah, I'm going to talk to you about React and Flux. Um, some content might be overlapping with what uh, Laszlo mentioned in the previous talk, but um, we will see what we have. So, I'm going to start with React.js um, and define what it is. So, where you declare um, like your DOM elements or even components because you can really compose components between each other. So <coughs> you're pretty free. Uh, you have a lot of freedom when it comes to that. Another thing which is pretty important is uh, this get initial state, which is just declaring the state of your component data, which is going to be persistent through the through your component. And um, this is the most actually important part. The set state, when you call this function, this is, this is what is going to re-trigger the rendering of your component. Um, so it means your, the data of your component is changing, so this is where the virtual DOM is going to kick in and do the diffing and just re-render. And also, um, you, you can pass properties to component. Um, you can see that as just like function parameters and what you have to know is this data is immutable so you can just use it but you cannot modify it and this is just how you pass data around your components through the state when you store it or through properties where you, you just consume it and that's all. Um, so now what is Flux? Flux is not MVC so just as a reminder this is MVC where you have three parts in your system. You have your views, what you display, your model, which is your data in your application, and the controller, which is kind of the glue of everything. So when something happens on one of your view, uh, one of your views, you will just, an, an event is triggered, and the controller is going to get it, and it's going to update something in your model, and your model can just say to the controller, oh, I did that, so you need to change what is rendered, and so on. So this is actually a good idea, but what happens is when you add a lot of views and a lot of models, it, became, it becomes really hard to, to see what's happening in your system. Like those events are going all around, your data is changing, you might not be able to be able to track it around. So you're just in this like updates hell where you have cascading updates around and it's not, it's not good. Flux tried to, to fix this, but having a uni unidirectional data flow in your application. So those are just full of buzzwords. So what it means is just a one-way loop in your application. There is only one direction for your data to flow through all your different components, and, and it makes everything easier. Um, so how does it work? At the same as MVC, you have three components. You have your views, where basically you use React, and you have uh, the re-rendering on each update and so on, and you have this, uh, I don't know if you can see it, but like this user interaction on click, and this is just <coughs> an action that you define. I'm going to explain later exactly what it is. And this, you dispatch an action, the dispatcher is going to receive it, and just going to pass it to stores, which are basically models, um, but the store are just subscribing to the dispatcher, so they just they are just telling the dispatcher, oh, I'm interested in this kind of action, so when it happens, just let me know. The dispatcher doesn't know what the store is going to do. He doesn't care. He's just passing, oh, I have this message. Everybody who is interested, he like, here it is. And the stores are just going to update their state. So the stores contain the data of your application. And when they are, everything is updated, they just tell to the views, OK, I'm done updating, and you depend on me, so now we'll just re-render. And that's all. And what is also really cool is just at the fact you dispatch actions, you can really plug in um, external sources. So like you can have API calls and so on where you just say, okay, you did your API call and you dispatch an actions. And that's it's exactly the same way as with some user interactions. And you can extend it really easily. You just add stores and the stores are just subscribing to the dispatcher and to actions, and you can add a lot of views depending on different stores. It's not an issue. Um, 
So some more details. So the dispatcher, I like to see it as something really done. So it's just getting actions and pass it around. And it doesn't care who is subscribing to it. It just knows, OK, you can subscribe to me. Just do it. And I'm just giving you what you're interested in. So there is no real logic. Just people plugging, uh, get, yeah, getting plugged to it. And actions um, <coughs> are not really like events. They are like high level actions. So um, it's, it's a bit more generic than real events. And you can define it pretty much as you want, but usually uh, an action is just an object with a specific type where your stores are going to filter on, on those types. And you can just pass a payload, which, is, which can be nothing, a simple object or something really complex. It depends on your implementation. Um, and the stores um, are like components interested in specific actions. So they can be interested in really a lot of different actions. But they are always going to do the same, receive some uh, properties from an action and just update their state. And when they are updated, then they notify the, the viewers and it's re rendering. So uh, you notify the viewers through callback, basically. Your view will be having some, some stores and uh, yeah, the stores just notify. Um, but that's, that was like the in a perfect world. So we have been experimenting with Flux since a few weeks now. And um, so how do we use it in reality? <coughs> uh, crazy. So I'm going to go through like five points. Uh, I'm going to group the first two together. Uh, because the hard part is to know where you should store, where you should put stores, when you have to use stores, because you can just sometimes use properties or like having a state on a component and so on. So. Uh, for that, I'm just going to go through a small example. Um, so I just put those two screenshots to create an example. So the first one is the top menu of the Prezi editor. So you can see some buttons and some drop down and whatever. And under it, it's the screenshot of the text editor, which contains what you can uh, modify on the text in your Prezi. So you can change, you can make it bold, italic put a background, change the color. Um, so, and in Prezi, we have two modes. We have the edit mode, where you create your presentation, and you add objects to your canvas, and you style them as you want, and so on. And you have the present mode, which is this mode, where you don't have any UI, you just have your content, and you go through your path. And to do that, um, to go from one mode to the other, you can just click on the present button that you can see on the top bar. Um, thank you. And um, so yeah, so what we want, the example that we want is how do we want to make the two widgets disappear when we click on present. So how is it going to happen in the with the flux system? But also, the top menu has a specific behavior on its own. So it can just, for example, uh, we're going to take the example that we want to know at any time which drop down is open. So we're going to need to find a way to, to know that. And the, top, uh, the text editor bar, we want to know, for example, when the bold button or the italic button is toggled because we need to render them differently when they are clicked. And I don't know if you can really see the color picker here, but it's supposed to display the current color of your text. So when you click on it, you have a small palette. You click on a color and it should be uh, shown there. So how would you how would we do that using flux and stores and so on? So this is the same representation but like in a simpler way. Um, so what you have to do when it comes to know when you have to make your widget disappear, you need to, to store really um, at the top level in which mode you are. So basically you're gonna have at the top level of your application an application store just storing if you're in prison mode or not. And you're going to have a, an application dispatcher. Um, and so when it comes to the top menu, the application store is not interested at all to know which drawdown is open and so on. It, just, it is just the top menu which has an interest in that. So the top menu can, can have uh, its own store and just a simple property. So it's a really simple store. It's just for the sake of the example. And it's own dispatcher. So it's just going to listen to 
a specific action. I clicked on this drop down, and this is the idea of my drop down, and it changes the store, and that's all. The application doesn't know about that. And now, what about the color picker, which is a bit more complicated, but it's still really, really manageable. Uh, so one more time, it has its own dispatcher, and it's just going to listen to different actions. But you're not limited to have only one store. You can have multiple store if you if you feel the need for that. Um, in this case, we have a property bar store, which just contains which button I clicked, um, and the color picker store, which just gonna remember which color is displayed. So you, when when you wanna do that, you you just need to think about okay, what is the most top level where? Oh no, you need to find the common ancestor to um, components which are interested in the same property. So in this case, you can duplicate if you want is prison mode in the top menu store and the property bar store, but it's totally useless because you can decide. Um, at an upper level if you need to re-render them or not. So that's the point of having an application dispatcher. Um, so that's how you should think about creating your store and what you should keep uh, track of in your applications. And you can also, what, what is really important is also to know that you can have your own behavior in your component. You're not limited to have everything at the top level. Um, so Flux is really good also for testing, because if you look at this graph, you can really separate the graph into two parts. You, can, you really see this testing separation. So what does it mean? It means you can um, really fake actions, and you don't need to have any UI in, in your unit test, or like fake any UI, because you just dispatch an action, and you can check really easily how your dispatcher is behaving, and how your scores <coughs> are updating. Uh, but then on the other hand, you can just also uh, create UI components and just inject properties to it, some data, and see that they render correctly, that they have the correct CSS classes or uh, the correct size and so on. So this is a huge advantage. Um, as a side note, uh, React.js comes with uh, add-ons, and one of them is for unit testing. And it gives you a lot of helpers. Uh, to simulate clicks, to simulate any user interaction, and also um, some great methods to like be able to find um, a component with a specific tag or a specific class name. Uh, so it makes unit testing really easy. Um, scaling up. So what do I mean by that? I mean adding features easily to the system and adding people to work on your system. Um, so with Flux, it's actually really easy um, because the fact that everything is kind of so independent, like your store does, don't really need to depend on each other, um, you can really experiment with having the, your first setup as having your own dispatcher and your own store. And after, you can just think about, oh, but this is common with some other stores and just refactor really easily. And um, when you have new people coming to your team, it's also pretty easy because they can just experiment on their own and they don't need to know a lot. They just need to know the basics, the, what the story is, what the dispatcher is, and how to interact with your view. So that's a, that's a really good point. Um, so as uh, Laszlo mentioned in the previous talk, we, we like to have modules all around. Um, so how does it work when you have a lot of UI modules? And um, what do we mean by that? So, we consider uh, a module to be just a, some people working on a set of features, but really independently from the rest of the application. But um, those features can be really interesting in some other um, state in your application. So how do you deal with that with Flux? So the idea is just to be able to have a global dispatcher. Um, I'm not going to go into implementation details here, but this is really just what you need because this, the store implementation is not going to change. Um, your actions, you can add them. You can add a lot of actions really easily. But the point is, the dispatcher is really the, the glue and what is centric in your application. So you really need um, a global dispatcher. The way you do it is, it's not really important. It's just you you need to make to be able to pass it around. Um, so the conclusion. Um, 
virtual DOM is really getting popular. Uh, so React has it. L, uh, I don't know if you know L, but it is like a FRP language for UI user interfaces. Uh, has also an implementation of it. And uh, lately, the uh, some guys from Ember JS, the framework, mentioned that um, users shouldn't be surprised if um, DOM diffing is coming into into the into the story. Um, but when it comes to re-rendering, um, it's actually not really new because Elm has been using it from the beginning. Uh, so um, it's, it's really similar to what React is doing. On each update, you're going to re-render everything. And Flux is also not really new because one more time, Elm is also um, following the same pattern, if we can say that like that. Uh, where you have your like model really separated from your update loop, really separated from your rendering. Um, just to finish, when it comes to the documentation, uh, Facebook did a really great job for the documentation. It's really clear. It has a lot of tutorials, so you should really check it out. And um, just because we like them, you should also check the Pong example. Which shows really how you should you could structure your program and have something really clean and easy to 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 manage. Um, that's all for me. So if you have any questions, I'm happy to take them. So yes, you can have that if you want. Um, so the way we actually did it was we are using BaconJS. Um, so you can really easily merge streams, uh, merge observable and like merge buses together. So it makes it really easy actually. Um, I don't really know. So we did it this way. I don't really know how you could do it with like anything else. To be honest, we haven't thought about it. Um, but. Just to mention that the Facebook does it using promises and it works also really well. Um, something I haven't mentioned is like, which is actually important, but I didn't mention it because we don't have the case right now. It's that stores can depend on each other um, to update. So with promises, it's actually pretty easy because you can just like uh, wait that all your promises are um, done to be to be executing something, but. With Bacon, it should be just a matter of merging streams, uh, but we don't have this case right now. We are trying to avoid it, actually. So just to mention that. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Jeremy. So this was the meetup. Thanks for coming. And if you have any uh, topics or ideas about what, what to present, uh, please send me an email or just uh, schedule a meetup at meetup.com and make a presentation. So, thanks for coming again. See you next time. Thank you.